Reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org. And you can post your questions in local chat, on the Ustream chat, or tweet your questions using the hashtag OSCC13. This hour, we are happy to introduce Vanish, who will be presenting I Am Avatar, How to Survive the Metaverse. Vanished have lived in Second Life since 19, excuse me, 2007 and in Open Sim since 2009. Vanish creates items, writes tutorials, does talks, manages communities, and runs his own grids. Vanish has, also has his own opinions. Ask him and, and he'll tell you all about them. He is also a singer, guitarist, and songwriter. He's been writing songs for 15 years and has released four albums. Welcome, Vanish. Thank you, Joe. Hello, hello everyone. Um, uh, before I start, I thought I'd uh, say a few <laughs> uh, sentences about questions. The way I had planned my presentation is that I'm going to be talking for about 40 minutes, and then I'll leave 20 minutes for Q&As from the audience. Um, I will be paying attention to questions typed in in-world chat and on the um, Ustream uh, stream. That is the OSCC6 channel. Um, I cannot, pay, due to technical reasons, I cannot pay attention to in-world voice chat. So if you have a question, please type it in local chat. Um, okay, so anyway, hi. My name is Vanish. Uh, you can call me V. Uh, most of you in the audience, I've looked around, I do know personally, so we're all friends here. Um, I'm going to talk today about how to survive the metaverse. Um, I wrote that talk, or that pitch for the talk, in early June this year, which was in some ways a much more innocent time than now so back then I thought I could actually tell you how to survive the metaverse um, without being spied on, ripped off or um, have your privacy intruded and just a few days later an NSA contractor named Edward Snowden made the world aware that the secret services of the US, UK Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are spying on the entire internet. So, um, I don't think I can in good conscience anymore tell you how to uh, get around that. It was part of my talk, and I'll get into it. It's just that we have now a much bigger question, or a much bigger problem than we did have a few months ago. Or... I guess we had that problem all along, we just didn't know about it. So, back then I wrote, we should do something about this. Um, I don't think that we, speaking indivi uh, us all individually, as well as we as a community, can actually do something about all of the problems we are facing. They, we have a bigger problem than that, but um, I, don't know. I think I can at least show you a little bit of what you can do about it. You know, the, ir the, the, the irony is that right now I'm on Skype holding this talk, knowing full well that I'm being spied on by at least a few dozen secret services all over the world. Um, and still I'm doing it because it is the the convenient and, and easy way to do, and um, that's a problem. So, the problem that we now, is not just how to survive the metaverse. Um, surviving the metaverse is, is one task for each of us individually, but for us collectively, the question is how the metaverse survives. Today, right now, OpenSim offers
messaging services. All of our in-world chat um, is being done well through either the in-built built-in chat module or through voice chat, and we do assume that the software does what it what it how it behaves. That in-world chat only carries 20 virtual meters. That voice chat is confined to the region it's being broadcast on. That private messages are only being sent to the person we are messaging and not to someone else. Um, OpenSIM also handles our inventory. Our inventory can have communications as well, such as note cards or even voice recordings. But um, moreover, it holds our, everything that makes up our virtual identities, everything that makes up the me in the virtual. It holds the appearance of our avatar, our clothes, our skin, our hair, everything that we have on us and use in world is in our inventory and we we would like to assume that we are the only ones who know what is in our inventories and can access that inventory um, to use the items that are in it. OpenSIM handles our regions which is pretty much our virtual home. Well, they can be public, such as this region, for example, or if you have like a, a shop or um, an in-world vendor, in-world maybe an, an art portfolio. But many, many regions of OpenSIM users are private. They're their homes. They're what they use to, to conduct their virtual lives around. Regions are, in, in that respect, pretty much very as private as your inventory itself. And you would like to assume that uh, when you have a virtual home that your, the access to your virtual home is restricted to the people that you let in and not to just anyone who wants to come by. OpenSIM further handles our contacts. That is, everybody who is on our contact list, everybody we talk to, what we talk about, um, what our relationship is. And again, you would like to assume that um, only you know who exactly is on your contact list or um, what your relationship is with them when how many times you talk where you talk what you talk about and furthermore OpenSIM handles money there is a built-in money module that can handle in-world currency if a grid has in-world currency enabled and again, you would like to assume that this money is being handled respectfully, that every, nobody knows exactly how much money you have, who you pay, what you pay for, how much you pay, and um, how frequent. But the problem is, as even Moglen put it, we did not build the net with anonymity built in. That is a mistake. And now we're paying the price for it. And likewise, we are currently not building OpenSIM with anonymity built in, the 3D web as it is. And um, that is the same mistake. And we are paying the same price for it. A few weeks ago, a very good friend of mine has made me aware of why privacy is really important. To her, OpenSIM is an escape. It's um, her home away from home. It's where she can be who she really wants to be and uh, get away from all the pressures of real world, all the, the things that you have to deal with in your everyday lives. Increasingly, though, <clears throat> this home gets intruded. Um, as the editor of the online, very popular online blog, Grokla, put it before she closed it, um, being spied upon online feels very much as the one time that somebody broke into her apartment in New York City and went through all her stuff. 
it is an intrusion, just like an intrusion into your real life uh, would be. And um, it feels the same way. So today, we have to pretty much live in a world where our online lives are being intruded and spied upon every day, all day. What do we do about this? Well, um, for one thing, there are a few um, technologies that we can deploy that um, have worked over the past. Okay. Um, one of these is OTR or viewer encryption, uh, chat enc encryption. Um, OTR has been around as a technology for a long time now. What it does is it um, encrypts the messages that are, that are being sent in a chat um, so that only the people on both ends of the chat, the people sending the message and the people receiving the message can see what is being transmitted and during transit the chat messages are invisible. If you are wondering why you can't see a slide, it is because I can't res any anymore. Uh, that's a technical problem. Um, OTR has, is not that hard to implement. In fact, we have had a viewer in Second Life that has had OTR built in before. It's, it was the ill-fated Emerald viewer who went out of circulation early 2010 after a scandal. Um, uh, that made us aware of other privacy intrusion problems like uh, the viewer developers trying to spy on you through backdoors they built into a viewer of their own. But it had an OTR plugin built into their viewer and um, well, I'm kind of wondering why no other viewer has implemented that after that. Um, The other thing you can do is, um, well, choose who you can trust with your communication. Um, apparently, you do not necessarily assume that your OpenSIM uh, grid provider is going to spy on you. So, um, Um, Danny, tr try reset setting again on the podium. The presenter. I'm sitting on the podium. This is actually the backup that I put in place just in case my slides don't work anymore. So we are at slide. I'm sorry about this. <clears throat> we'll get back to you after this short. Interruption. Um, 
The problem with trusting your grid provider is that can you trust uh, that grid provider's government not to spy on you? Can you trust on the grid provider um, to stand up against their own government if the government goes to them and te tells them we would like to have, I don't know, a transcript of all chat that is being conducted on your grid? Or better still, we would like to have our own backdoor so we can get a copy of every message that is being sent on your system and uh, spy on everybody who is on your grid. Otherwise, we will have to close you down. That is not a hypothetical uh, question. It is what happened to recently to the provider of LavaBit, which was a, an, an encrypted email provider in the United States, who among other things, hosted the emails of Edward Snowden when he was leaking that to The Guardian. Um, and they got approached by the government asking them for a copy of all the emails of their users. Um, otherwise, they would have to close shop and consequently, LavaBit said they did not, did not want to be complicit in crimes against the American people, so they closed down. So, this is the point where I, for the first time today, will uh, recommend to you to run your own OpenSIM. Running your own OpenSIM does not necessarily uh, protect you against any kind of spying that is going on, but at least it'll um, take several man-in-the-middle problems out of the, the picture and puts you back into control of your own communications. Inventory. Inventory is a tricky thing because inventory has a number of uh, dangers to face. Um, One of these is that inventory can get lost. And the stupidest thing that can happen to you is it is being lost because OpenSIM has a bug. And um, That happens. It happens regularly. It's something you have to expect when you use OpenSIM that your inventory gets lost frequently. It doesn't really matter if you are running your own OpenSIM or if you're running OpenSIM on someone else's um, grid or using someone else's service. Um, inventory can get lost and will get lost uh, frequently. Likewise, you can get banned from whichever OpenSIM provider you're using at the moment. Um, bans happen also very frequently. They happen so frequently that Second Life, or Linden Lab rather, had to face a class action lawsuit um, that was made out of a class of around 50,000 pla plaintiffs who have been banned from Second Life over the years and who um, well, I wanted nothing more than just have some kind of compensation for the inventory that got confiscated during their ban. Um, this can happen to you on any grid too, and it doesn't always need to be justified. It can, it, it, it's just something that you can, you have to take into account. There's sometimes bad blood and things get heated. Or, well, your grid can turn can can close shop. This is also something that happens frequently in OpenSIM. I've been going through the um, well the the latest Hypergrid business grid statistics. Maria from Hypergrid Business does publish every month her statistics about OpenSIM and how many grids are um, running at a given time, how many how big they are, and I just started counting. And over the four years that she has had these statistics out of the um, around about 400, 680 
grids um, that are that she has tracked. Uh, only 280 are operational today, so that means around 400 grids have closed down over the past um, four years, which means that a grid closes around every four days. What this means is that once you lose access to your inventory, you lose pretty much everything. Um, which is a sad thing for somebody to happen. Um, a workaround for that is to have backups. I cannot stress this enough. Make backups of everything you have. If somebody wants to prevent you from making backups, um, which means pretty much saving an OAR of your region or an IAR of your inventory, your entire inventory. Um, I would not recommend using their service. Backups are essential. It, only if you have something on your computer, you actually own it. One, as long as it is someone on someone else's computer, on someone else's service, you are subject to their goodwill of letting you access what you think you own. The same goes for your region. Um, your region is, as I said earlier, your home in the virtual. It is where you, where, where you, the center of your virtual life usually lies, and the most private part of your online, your 3D online presence. Um, if you rent your region from someone else, again, you do not own it. Someone else owns that, and you rent, well, access to your home which is, I think, a bad idea. Um, so, like I said before, try to run your own OpenSIM. It is not, uh, running your own OpenSIM is still more complicated than the average application you have to install, but it got much, 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 much more easy to deploy um, due to the efforts of people like, like Diva Kanto with the Diva Distro, um, Ina Hacks from, who made the Simonistic, and the good people who work on um, uh, the Simeon Grid that um, make it much easier for you to install and run your own OpenSIM installation. Then we have contacts. As I said before, your contacts are among the most private data you can have. Uh, your contacts are your friends, your spouses, your business partners, your sexual relationships, anything that you can think of that you visit in OpenSIM. And it is a sad thing if you lose contact to them. Um, again here, run your own OpenSIM, keep your contacts. You are in control of your own contact list. If you, it is also always a good idea to use outside services to not just rely on OpenSIM for everything. So if you have a Twitter or Google Plus account, or if you just exchange emails, that, me that means you can keep in contact um, in case something goes awry and uh, you lose some of your contacts on your list. Or very good idea as always, have your own website, have your own online presence where people can go to and know that this is where they can go to when they want to know about what's going on with you and what you're up to and want to contact you. Finally, money. Um, lots of OpenSIM grids are running their own in-world currency. Um, which means that you first start buying a virtual currency from the providers and then use that currency to conduct business in world. I always think it's a bad idea to, well, A, trust your OpenSIM provider with everything and B, trust someone else with your money. So, um, because in the case of you, for example, losing access to that grid, either because it goes down or because you get banned or because, well, again, something happens and OpenSIM 
has a bug and miscalculates a transaction or uh, the transaction of the money takes place but you do not receive your items, stuff like that. Um, you have very little you can do about getting in-world currency back. Um, the problem with that is that, uh, well, even though it is probably embezzlement or theft on the, if, if somebody takes in-world currency away for you without, from, without compensating you for it, um, usually it goes unpunished. And so the first idea is to only have as much money in world as you are willing to lose. Um, in some cases, that might mean not having any currency in world at all. A better idea, I would say, would be to use other payment providers than the OpenSIM uh, money module. Uh, there is a nice plugin for OpenSIM that uses PayPal for transactions, which comes with all the problems that PayPal brings, um, such as, you know, PayPal having a track of all your transactions and PayPal has sometimes some very arbitrary uh, bans of, of what they, you know, what they support and what they don't. But at least it's, um, it's better than trusting one entity with everything. A better idea would be to use Bitcoin, actually, because Bitcoin is a distributed um, payment system that puts you back into control of your own virtual wallet. Uh, at the same time as this presentation, there's in a different breakout, so I'm not exactly sure where, a presentation of how to use Bitcoin for your grid. Um, I, I'm, I, I would have loved to attend that. I'm, I, I'm sad that I missed it, but it should be live on the Ustream website after the conference. So if you're interested in how that works, I'm sure the other presenter can tell you all about it. <clears throat> Bottom line. Run your own OpenSIM. Do as much as you can keep control of everything that goes on in your virtual world because it is about not just who you visit, it's about your own, as Justin said in the keynote presentation, it's your personality, it's who you are online. And um, I would not like to uh, have control over my personality in somebody else's hands. Use the hypergrid. Use um, a distributed system that allows you to have your own home on your own computer and likewise visit other people's homes and um, as easy as you would teleport on a, on a grid itself um, because a peer-to-peer -peer system gives the control back into the hands of the individual users. This is the one great chance we have now to take back control of the web as it is about to come and um, have it into the hands of the endpoints instead of having it or most of the control at the center of the, where the servers are. And make ba backups and download everything you can to store it on your own computer. Um, William Gibson, one of my favorite authors, was um, he in in his mm, well in his short story Johnny Mnemonic actually he introduced the word, the word uh, cyberspace and um, coined it further in his first novel Neuromancer and that was in 1982 when nobody really thought about a world inside a computer and um, he has given a well a reading actually of his latest then latest novel Idoro in Second Live in, I think, 2007. And being asked about what he thought about this cyberspace as it is now, um, he later said that he was kind of disappointed by the top-down hierarchy, as he said, of the Second Life system. It felt a little bit like Disneyland. Um, he said that in the stories that he cooked up, um, the cyberspace was always run by somebody 
uh, in someone else's basement or in someone's back room on cheap computers run by kids who didn't, couldn't afford um, good networks. And um, these kids would make universes in their basements. And that is, I guess, the point of my talk today. Make universes in, your, in the computers, in your basements and back rooms. And let's make this a truly distributed peer-to-peer -peer virtual universe. Thank you. If there's any questions, I will, I'll be happy to address them. Any questions, anyone? Well, Thank you very while much. We're wait, while we're waiting for some questions, I will make a mention here that this region is not being used next session, so there's no reason to run off. So if anybody wants to stick around and discuss, I think you're more than welcome to. Uh, at this point, do we have any questions? I'm not um, seeing it. You're all awestruck. That's good. So thank you, Vanish, for a terrific presentation. Thank As you I very said, much. I'll stick yeah. around. So if somebody wants to talk with me later, um, I'll be around for a while. Okay, and as a reminder... Uh, to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. And again, as Vanish just noted, we there is nothing scheduled, so he said he'll stick around and to answer any questions you have. So thank you again to our speaker and the audience. Thank you. Oh, okay. There is a question. Okay, go for it. Um, Question about OTR. Does it still provide deniability in the presence of a trusted record keeping man in the middle? Say, if the SIM operator is trusted not to alter its logs. Um, not quite sure if I understand that correctly, Boren. The, the idea is that the SIM operator is the man in the middle, and um, if he keeps all the records of all the, the chat logs, or all the, all the chats that are taking place, um, there, well, the thing is this, um, up until June this, this year, we have kind of assumed that um, anonymity can, can be possible in the case that there is no single entity who can surveil the entire internet. I think that assumption is something we can now throw overboard. So, it, I don't think the man in the middle needs to be the weak point in this case. If there is an entity that can uh, surveil the entire internet, then they can see that you are sending a message into, you know, from your computer at the same time someone else receives a message. The message is the same length or the, the, the packets are the same, the same size. So that means that entity can conclude that you two are talking together. I don't think you can plausibly deny that anymore. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really have to be a man in the middle problem, even though that adds another layer to it. Is that, does that answer the question? We have a, another question from Beth that says, should we just yeah, assume that. that we're being observed all the time? Um, well, uh, I think that question is is I, I think that you have to you have to be a bit uh, more specific because the yes you have to be, have to assume that you are being observed all the time automatically. Um, the question is who is observing you? Um, you can uh, assume that secret services are going to spy on the entire internet and every communication that's happening all the time. It's not that you are being targeted, ex especially. It's just that every communication is being stored 
just in case we would, somebody would need it later on. Um, that is a secret service problem. With uh, grid providers, I don't know. I don't know if they're, if they're spying on you or not. Um, nobody asks them, and even if they, they would say something about it, um, do you trust them or not? That's up to you. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of different entities who can spy on you. And um, I guess my attempt is to, to lower the number of entities that can spy on you. Well, uh, Cameron, that is an, a thing that I keep hearing a lot, that people, you know, that their lives aren't that interesting. And I don't think that's, that's a... I don't think that is the right way to think about it. Um, you know, everybody has sex, but not everybody wants to have sex with everyone else. And it's the same on the internet. I have, of course, I communicate, but I don't want to, everybody to listen in on my communications. Any more questions uh, for Vanish that we've missed by chance? Yes, as Boren says, um, there are filters that extract interesting parts and you do not really know what is interesting. You don't, don't really, nobody of us knows what the, the NSA, for example, is interested in. Or, I don't know, the Chinese secret service whose name I don't know. Um, they may have filters that that you don't know about. Um, and there are numerous talks about of people who, who went into the spotlight of a secret service bec just because that secret service used the wrong filters and uh, suffered the consequences for it. Um, and the other thing is that you do not know what the filters are going to be five years from now or ten years from now when your communications are still being stored somewhere else and another government may decide that they don't like people with, I don't know, a Texan accent or, I don't know, people who dyed their hair blonde at one point. Okay, crickets. All right, if there's not any more questions, then I thank you all for coming. Um, I'm always amazed if the audience is greater than the band, so thank you for coming in such great numbers. And uh, I'll see you around. All right, once again, thank you for uh, Vanish for speaking, and thank you for everybody for coming. <laughs>